Welcome back to 360 Sports Network, 3SN on Twitter. I'm Greg Fischero, and with me tonight is James Dotson. James, how are you out there this evening? I'm doing well. I'm ready for the uh, rapidly approaching start of college football season, which just means that we're rapidly approaching yet another controversy for the BCS, in my mind. And you know what? The controversies have already just begun. Of course, we, if, in case you've been hiding under a rock out in outer Uganda somewhere, uh, you know about the University of Miami and their, uh, their, their booster scandal. Of course, that is on the heels of what's been going on at the University of North Carolina. And that, of course, is on the heels as to what's happened to Jim Trestle. And uh, it just seems that the whole entire foundation of college football and college sports has just been uh, just been uh, shaken up and uh, round up around, much like the earthquake that happened to us today. Uh, it's, well, besides shaking around, yeah, it's uh, it's been an absolute travesty to see more and more coming out. And yet, like you said, not just in college football, but you get college basketball uh, recruiting scandals and uh, scouting scandals, but when you get these boosters going around, like Nevin Shapiro down in Miami, and who claims that 72 athletes have received everything from money to uh, benefits to merchandise to prostitution to abortions. I mean, it, it's one thing to get money. I mean, it's still wrong and against the NCAA, but when we're talking about getting stuff like abortions paid for and uh, prostitutions and strip clubs. That's This is just out of control right now. Yeah, and we wonder why we have such a behavior problem in the NFL. I think it all stems from the permissive atmosphere that the NCAA has allowed uh, by not really uh, having strict uh, standards of enforcement at the collegiate ranks. Uh, and, and, you know, James, you know, I, I've been around... Uh, I've been around the horn quite a bit here. I, uh, I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh and 1987 and then again in 1989 and of course that was in the good old days when uh, when uh, defensive ends were driving around in Mercedes Benzes with uh, out-of-state license plates and of course they all were bankrolled and everything and nobody thought twice about that situation in case you're wondering that was the Tony Wood situation way back in 1987 but nonetheless here we are today and everybody's just seemingly so shocked that Terrell Pryor would actually uh, sell his name uh, for uh, for a tattoo or uh, or to give away game jerseys and things such as that. I really firmly believe that you know there, there's a fine line that has to be that has to be drawn here between what the players are doing for the university and for the football boosters and what the football boosters are doing to ruin the programs itself. Now, in the Ohio State situation, Terrell Pryor is no angel by any means. Jim Trestle, I think uh, the cover-up was worse than the crime in Jim Trestle's situation here, although, you know, hey, the crime was committed, you know, by Jim Trestle basically, you know, covering this up to protect his players. But let's take a look at this realistically. You're a football player. You come from a poor uh, an economically disadvantaged home front, okay? Um, Single-parent family, whatever, tremendous amount of talent. You get a full scholarship to play football for a major university, but that scholarship only covers the bill to go to the school. It doesn't cover books. It doesn't cover supplies. It doesn't cover activity fees. Here you and, are. Yeah, and, or even, yeah, most of them, I don't even think cover meal plan half the time here. Exactly. Exactly. So, with that said, here you are, this poor college, this poor college kid on a ramen noodles diet, okay, uh, playing football, bringing in millions of dollars for your NCAA Division One university, and you think, you know, I can't even fly my mama to come and watch the football game with me, you know, to watch me play football, or I can't fly my brothers and sisters in to see me play. So, you know, I really believe that there needs to be a stipend. Graduate students get stipends uh, to study. Why can't we give a stipend to the student athlete? $500 a month. That's a little bit of money that could actually go toward books and supplies. 
It could uh, go toward a meal plan. It could go toward buying an airline ticket for you know to bring uh, mom and dad to come and watch the game maybe once or twice during the football season. Or if we make it to a bowl game, hey, you know they can fly them to the bowl game, something like to that extent. I really think the NCAA. I mean, and I hate to say they're, they're out to lunch here in a lot of things, and this is one of the things that I think they're out to lunch on. They really need to kind of put something together because colleges and universities are greatly benefiting from the labor that these college football players are putting forth every Saturday. And I mean, I don't know if you got to go fully to money. I mean, it's it's a joke that these players can't go and pay. You you can't you can't pay them enough essentially, I guess is what I'm saying that I mean, even $500 a month, you're barely going to be able to get them to come out to games. But the thing is, how many of those players, yeah, the real morally sound ones would go and use that money to pay to have their parents come out and play and uh, watch them play. But how many of them will go out and, and use that $500 to buy tattoos or spend $500 on uh, a steak dinner down at uh, Roost Chris and then realize, oh, I'm out of money, and then you're right back in the same situation again. Yeah, but you know what? I, I think what happens though is if we if we draw that line, I, I really think though that the players that are abusing it could then be punished, or could then be sanctioned. Let's put it that way, okay? Right. Because, uh, and, and, and right now, unfortunately, all we're hearing about is that one to two percent out there that's ruining it for everybody else right now in, in, in collegiate sports. Uh, of course, you had that uh, infamous booster at Ohio State that leaked this whole thing about Terrell Pryor and, and Jim Trestle with a whole hullabaloo there. The, of course, now you have the real infamous guy down there at the University of Miami who admits to sponsoring uh, prostitution and abortion rings. Uh, yeah. You know, well, I think well go, let's go back to Ohio State real quick because this is something that I've always wondered. Um, I mean, going beyond the Terrell Pryor, but going to the other players where they sold... Um, some of them sold the gold pants, which they won for when they beat uh, Michigan in a game, and uh, their Big Ten championship rings. Some of them sold or traded them. Here's my question. That is something that the university awarded them for their performance, for how well they did. Right. How is that not, at that point, considered to be their property? What is the line that uh, the school gave this to me, but I'm not allowed to sell it? I, to me, if, if you give me something right now, Greg, uh, I should be allowed to do whatever I please. I should be allowed to go and sell it. If I want to put it on eBay right now and see what I can make with whatever you gave me, I don't see why that should ever be an issue. Exactly. I, I fully agree. You know, it, it, but let's, you know, it, it, might, it might smart of tackiness for what they've done, but they, it's within their right. This is their own personal private property. Now, 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 get this, and this is the loophole in the NCAA rule. They could have taken those gold pants and given it to their father or mother and had their father and mother put it on eBay and sell it, and that would have been perfectly fine. But they could not sell it themselves. And, yeah, because, and that's exactly the loophole, but you don't get into that because I think that um, some of these players, they just aren't even being educated. I mean, not that that's something you should say, hey, you can't sell this, but give it to your mom and she can. I mean, that that's I mean, going above and beyond. I just think that if there is a rule change in my mind in that regard, it should be about what is considered um, transferable or sellable. I mean, if you're going to give them a shirt, let them do what they want with it. If they don't want the shirt, they shouldn't be uh, limited to what they do with it. I, I just think that's where we have the bigger issues than... Uh, somebody going and giving giving away their autograph for a tattoo. Exactly. Now, and, and what we're seeing right now is uh, this thing going way beyond uh, what's uh, considered to be uh, uh, sane and normal, uh, where now all of a sudden you're having, uh, you know, raucous parties and, uh, and uh, events being uh, you know, sponsored by... Uh, by uh, by representatives of the university that I believe the university needs to step up and I believe the NCAA needs to step up and say, look, if you sponsor something like this, if you sponsor prostitutes or you sponsor abortions or you sponsor something that's illegal, then you can never be a booster again. You can never set foot within the university again. And if they're a graduate of the university, 
following the same mindset that they that players can't sell their uh, can't sell their possessions that they've got or they earned for their performances. Perhaps the university should strip these people of their uh, of their degrees, perhaps. Oh, well, the thing is, though, how many of these athletes in question, uh, sad to say, how many of them went on to get their degree? I, I, see, I think that's where you can really fix this whole thing if the NCAA would just wake up a bit. Instead of them feeling the need that they need to get this, uh, that they need to go and get this extra money, why don't they realize that, you know what, in four years, if I'm a good enough player, guess what, I'm going to be a professional. And if not, hmm, I better wake up and realize that, hey, if I get a degree, I'll at least be getting some money, and I'm not paying for my degree right now, so I should be able to get my thing for my, uh, my degree for free and be able to pay anything. And what I don't understand is what every college student out there, or nearly every one of them, has to do when they need money for college. They take out a loan. Right. These student athletes are getting their tuition paid for, so, you know what, if they still need a little bit of extra money on the side, if they really feel they need it, why not take out a loan? And if the teams and the universities are uh, teaching them and showing them that, hey, look, in four years, you're either going to graduate or you're going to go pro. And either way, you're going to make money. You're going to make the money to pay that off in one year, or if not less. So wake up, realize that if you got the talent, great, you're going to pay it off. If you don't got the talent then get your butt in the, in the class. Because I'll tell you what, especially in college basketball, where you have all these one-and-done schools, where half of them probably don't even go to class because they're only there for one year. They don't care. It's, it's absolutely pointless in that regard for them to, to go to class to pay for anything when they know they're not getting a degree. So why don't we give them an incentive to stay in school if they're not professional material? I agree. I agree. And I think this also goes back to perhaps paying them uh, five hundred dollars a month. You know that works out to be about six grand a year. Have that go toward uh, student activity fees, meal plans, books, supplies, uh, whatever's left over is theirs. And uh, it's going to teach them a little bit of money management. Uh, it's going to be definitely a perk for the student athlete to um, to behave himself and to do what he's supposed to be doing. Uh, and that, that's the only issue I see, though, is that you can't control where that $500 is going to go. And that's the only thing that really scares me, is that if you give this $500 a month, I'm worried about what that money will actually go to. You hope that they will do the right thing, but we uh, you these are college athletes who like being in the spotlight. You know, my major problem with all this is the concern for the student athlete. These are kids that basically are living their dream, wanting to play football, wanting to play basketball, uh, or a multitude of sports for that matter. And whenever they are doing this and somebody is profiting from this and benefiting from this without the student actually benefiting from this itself, that's where I'm having a problem. And, and now, let me kind of explain where I'm coming from here. Yes, the student has a full athletic scholarship to play for, let's say, a school like uh, the University of Notre Dame. I'm just using that as an example. That covers uh, their education. Okay, fine. You can say you've got a Notre Dame degree because you went to the University of Notre Dame and you had a full athletic scholarship. That's great. But you take a look at the Notre Dame athletic boosters. You take a look at the billions of dollars that they're, that they're making off of the television contract with NBC. You take a look at uh, how their football program and basketball program, for that matter, and how that's being run, and you take a look at the personnel changes that happen because they might not have a winning season. And then you start to scratch your head there. You think, wait a second, what are, what are these kids doing? This is no longer student athletics. This is no longer student athletics. This is now a big time business with a bunch of unpaid players. And these students are out there, and they are putting their life and limbs at risk. Granted, some of them will go to the NFL, but not a whole lot of them will. Basically, uh, I believe Bill Keller said in an interview, basically 2% of all student athletes end up in professional sports. So with that said, with that 2% said, let's be generous. Let's say 5% 
end up in professional sports? Where do the other 95% end up? They end up getting their degrees or doing something else. So let's pay these players a stipend so that they're not indentured servants and, and give, them, you know, give them a fair sense of what it's worth so that they can take care of, uh, of, of the basic needs that are out there so that uh, we're not going to be seeing people going out there and selling their autographs or selling their gold pants uh, for beating uh, Michigan. Uh, or, or doing something stupid like selling their class rings or memorabilia because, uh, hey, they want to take a girl out to a movie or they want to basically, uh, you know, do something that most college kids want to do. So Yeah, Te but, teach them the money management. They're, they're going to need the money management too. If you teach them that along with giving them this money to play with, you, you can do it. You can you can make them into better better young men and women, better uh, better adults and better human beings in the process. Yes. Now, with that said, that's one element of what's wrong with college sports. The other element, of course, we just addressed earlier is are the uh, are the horrible violations that <clears throat> happen at the University of Miami, where I really believe these football boosters that are going out there and enabling these inner city kids, as well as kids from the country. I mean, they, let's face it, kids are kids, and kids are going to get, you know, they the, get the curiosity factor, the wow factor, the whole bit, and you're going to go out there and break rules and <clears throat> commit mayhem. You should be banned from that sport on a collegiate level for life. And the NCAA needs to step up and say, hey, these are the rules. These are the guidelines. You violate them. You're out. You're out. One and done. You're gone. You're out. That happens. You're no longer involved in collegiate sports. And that should also go for the student athlete as well who gets himself or herself involved in such a scandal as well and that's basically going to clean up that by, by basically making that a uniform standard across the board it's unfortunate right now james that the ncaa seems to be only in agreement that they can serve cream cheese with bagels at sporting events but they can no, they cannot police the aberrant uh, conduct of uh, the school boosters that are out there and that just that just uh, amazes me they have the time to figure out that uh, cream cheese is better than jelly, but they can't figure out that you're not going to be able to uh, let these boosters do what they want. You're, you're going to let it be in the school's hands for the time being at least, and then 10 years down the road when you find out that there were issues, then you decide to punish the school, and then you're not punishing the athletes who screwed up. You're punishing the athletes who are currently there, and that's what it bothers me then. Because even if you want to go back to the Reggie Bush incident, um, where they vacated, I believe it was all of their 2004 season victories, um, and he vacated his Heisman Trophy, and they, USC vacated their national championship. You know what? You can say you vacated them, but that still doesn't take away from the fact that uh, the Bush push technically never happened. The, what, what was it, 12-0 season that they had never happened. Their 55-21 to 21 championship win over Oklahoma never happened. You're going to tell to all those players who were there that, oh yeah, that, that really didn't happen. You didn't win that game um, because of what one of your teammates did. And, and uh, to me, it's just like, you know what, it's in history. You can't say it didn't happen because then you're going to have people like, I believe it was Auburn, who was also undefeated one year and never got a chance at the national title saying that, well, we would have been there. We would have had the chance. Or Penn State was a one-loss team that year. Would they have been in there as a possible national championship uh, contender? You don't know what would have happened, and by just telling these guys 10 years down the road, you know what, we're just going to rescind everything that happens in, as far as the BCS is concerned. And I, I just don't think that's the fair punishment that you can give to a school in that regard. Same thing with Miami. I mean, it's a little different that you have – a bunch of players right now, including their starting quarterback, who are tied with, with Nevin Shapiro here. But it's still the fact that what issues have happened between this guy and former players is what is going to cost the players that are currently there. And how about the fact that they have a brand new coach, who I'm sure in his two months at the University of Miami has had absolutely no idea of what's going on down in that program. Well, I'm sure he's had some idea, obviously, but uh, no, but you're you're 100 percent right. I mean, he probably does not have the full sc uh, the full scope as to what's going on. And I would even gather to say, I really don't even think the university president knows 
the full scope of what's been happening out there. I believe that this is just corruption upon corruption upon corruption that has been covered up uh, for so long, and now it's just starting to uh, fester and bubble over into a stew of uh, uh, a multitude of problems. So, but well, yeah, getting back but... to this, we cannot negate what Reggie Bush has done. You know, Reggie Bush having to give back the Heisman Trophy smacks of what we're just talking about here. This is what he had earned. This is, you know, he, and, and you can say, well, his conduct was not becoming of the Heisman Trophy, but was it becoming of the Heisman Trophy when he won the trophy? Yes or no? If it, was, then if it wasn't, then don't give it to him. You know, I mean, you know, we are not a society of uh, we're going to give and take and give and take and give and take because that's what we feel. I mean, if, if he earned it, he keeps it. And uh, and I really believe that uh, the NCAA needs to basically step up and say, hey, this is it. This is what we're going to do and, and stick by those guns. Now, mm -hmm. let's shift gears here a little bit and talk a little bit about Roger Goodell now in the NFL. Roger Goodell and the Terrell Pryor situation has come out and said, oh, yes, Terrell, you can, uh, you can participate in the supplemental draft, but you have to sit out the first five games of the NFL season. Huh? He's not doing anything any worse than what uh, the coach of the Seattle Seahawks, Pete Carroll, did when Pete Carroll sprinted, and I mean sprinted, away from the USC program to take the job. At Seattle, and so so should Pete Carroll have to sit out five games because USC is under investigation for uh, violations? I don't see that happening. And what about the University of Miami players? Are all the players that leave the University of Miami next year and decide to go into the NFL draft are they going to have to sit out five games as well? Well, this is absolutely mind-boggling to me. Now, in defense of Roger Goodell for 10 seconds, because that's all I will ever defend him, he has stated quite clearly that you are not to take what he did with Terrell Pryor as any sort of precedent. Now, that being said, anything that anybody does in this world is going to be seen as a precedent in some way or another. So, to, to me, the way I read into his decision is that he was going to be given a five-game suspension at Ohio State. In his attempts to undermine the, the sanctity of what the supplemental draft is supposed to be all about, that Terrell Pryor undermines it, therefore he must be punished. And I, I agree with that. But then at that point, why let him in? You just stated that he undermined what the supplemental draft is about, but you're going to let him in anyway. Hey, and it, would, it would actually be better for Terrell Pryor to actually set out the entire season and to, and to enter the NFL draft in April of next year. Didn't work well for Maurice Claret, did it? Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I see that. I, I think you you got to be able to... Uh, taking a year off isn't isn't going to do him any good as an athlete, but what's that going to do as, as a player? It, originally, Terrell Pryor was told he cannot enter the supplemental draft, that he did not qualify under the standards. So what does he do? He has his attorney find out more violations and announce more violations that he committed while he was at Ohio State. And those extra violations would have made him, so they say, would have made him uh, ineligible for the entire year. Therefore, he is eligible for the supplemental draft. So showing that, oh, yeah, I also made these mistakes. Oh, okay, you made those other mistakes. So we'll, go ahead. We'll let you in the, in the draft now. That's fine. Yeah, it's uh, two wrongs trying to make a right here, it seems. And uh, unfortunately, in this whole skewed mess that we have right now, it's uh, it, it, it has indicated that as such. Uh, it, it's, it's truly an unfortunate situation that's been happening right now. Uh, I really think Roger Goodell uh, had intended to make Ter Terrell Pryor an issue uh, and had intended to single him out only because it was the cause du jour in order for him to do that, just as much as uh, he singled out Ben Roethlisberger for Ben's aberrant behavior, and he singled out Michael Vick for Michael Vick's infractions of the law. And, um, and of course, this, this whole conversation started with the NCAA, and I don't want to go too far 
and with what Roger Goodell has done. But once again, this all kind of piggybacks on the same murkiness. Well, what are the appropriate sanctions for aberrant behavior? You can even make an argument about professional baseball during the drug scandals. Yeah. Uh, and the Mark McGuire situation, you know, and the asterisk for the home runs. You know, and human growth hormones, is it or isn't it? Uh, well, Barry Bonds, well, his head's gotten a lot bigger over the past couple of years. Maybe it did. I'm not sure. You know, I mean, it's, well, it's, it's insane. Yeah, you know, Greg, for, yeah, it is what's wrong with college sports right now, but it stems upon what is happening in the NFL level because the NFL is what takes precedent. These college kids don't worry about going to college. They're worrying about going pro. They don't. They don't realize unless they're specifically told that yeah, only two percent of all college athletes are going to make the pros, and only about uh, of that two percent, probably uh, about ten percent of that are going to ever start a game and make any sort of decent money living that way. So I mean, to me, it's that when you have the NFL as the basis, and when you have uh, the NFL pretty much taking control of, and Roger Goodell especially, controlling what's going to happen to these individual players, making individual precedences, then I see college athletes looking the same way and saying, well, you know, if he was able to do that, then I'm going to be able to do that. But let me ask you this, though, Greg. Uh, you look at, at this Terrell Pryor incident, for example, where he was uh, allowed into the supplemental draft even though Originally, they said, no, he would not fall under the guidelines that it would take to do it. Does this happen with every player who would be in this exact same situation? Or is Roger Goodell almost forced the hand that he plays because this is Terrell Pryor? This is a high-octane type of player. This is a big name. Everybody knows about him. It, does that make any difference in your mind, do you think? And once again, I think in Roger Goodell's mind, I think it did make a difference because it is the cause celeb, it was the cause du jour as to what's been going on. Yeah, it is Terrell Pryor, who happened to have an insane number of touchdowns whenever he played for Ohio State and led his team into uh, into uh, many bowl appearances that he's been there. But, uh, you know, but yeah, for, for Joe Schmo or Fred Schmidt or whomever who might be in an NCAA Division three school who may have uh, committed some sort of infraction like that, I don't think Adele would let this guy in as well. And uh, once again, you have to take a look at these things and say, you know, with a big-name profile person like Terrell Pryor, yes, you are making a statement. Yes, you are making a precedent. And uh, whether you like it or not, that is something that you have to adhere to. And let's shift gears here a little bit. Now, here, James, we've yes. talked about from the collegiate level to the professional ranks where we're running into some problems. Let's talk about going backwards now. Let's talk about the, the NCAA enforcing these schools and telling them, hey, you can't go into the high schools. And then in somebody's sophomore year in high school, offer them a letter of intent to play ball for their particular school. Yeah, and, and we're starting to see that now happening with certain colleges and universities because the pressure is on for good young talent to come and play for uh, USC or to come and play for uh, uh, you know, University of Tennessee or Notre Dame or, or Pitt or, or whatever. Uh, you're starting to see people, uh, you know, high school kids now, starting to get interests. Obviously, oh, it's good that they're getting interests. But whenever they're offering them, uh, giving them a letter of intent stating that, okay, in your 10th grade year in high school, you are going to sign and you're going to play for this particular school, that's, that's horse hockey as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, oh, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, this is the one that kills me, though. Uh, this happened in February of 2010, so about a year and a half ago. Uh, David Sills, who is a 7th grade quarterback, he made a verbal commitment to accept a college football scholarship from USC. And this is when he was 13 years old in seventh grade. Uh, this, uh, you'd want to talk about sophomore. You're going all the way back now to, to these players getting looked at and making verbal commitments when they're still barely a teenager. Junior and, high. Yeah, seventh grade. Junior high. This, this is just, it's beyond comprehensible in my mind that, First of all, that you can think you can see the talent from that far away, because that's, I mean, they're barely even uh, 
full, fully developed. What's going to happen? I want to see what happens to this kid. Will he go to USC? Will he even go to any college program in the next four years? Uh, uh, that teams feel they need to go this far in advance? Uh, I'm at a loss for words on this one, Greg. Yeah, and, and this is where the NCAA needs to get off of their uh, gray poupon and cream cheese issues and start focusing on uh, real issues. Okay, when is the minimum age? What is the minimum age, that is, to start looking at uh, kids to go to your college and university? I always thought that it was whenever you took your PSATs and your SATs that colleges could start to look at you. But uh, junior high? Come on now. I mean, this is going to be, this is going to be uh, ridiculous. I mean, you're telling me that you tell me that seventh grader took his PSATs. I mean, I mean, I, it makes sense that yes, that's what leads you into college. Remember, we are talking about college, not sports. This is a university and college issue first about when you can look at a kid. Then you talk about okay, let's look at him for coming to our university. Then let's look at him for coming to play for our team. And I think that's gotten completely lost over the last couple decades. Oh yeah. And I really believe that there needs to be a congressional inquiry if Congress could ever get off their high horse and figure out that they can, hey, we can get along now. But I really believe that there needs to be a, a federal investigation done on this matter with transcripts made available to everybody uh, outlining all these infractions. We have been asleep at the switch here. I mean, and it's, it's kids and student athletes that are being taken advantage of by big money. And if this is what our country's all about, well, okay, fine. Then that's what it's all about. But uh, I really don't think that that's what the premise of the NCAA is supposed to be. And I really don't think that uh, uh, the, the American people want that to have, to want to have that happen either. Um, I'd love to hear, uh, I'd love to hear from people here on Twitter on this. So uh, if you have any thoughts on this, please chime in uh, your comments are invaluable. And Roger Goodell, if you're out there, I want an explanation. I know you monitor us. Please, I want an explanation, Roger. I want to find out why you made Terrell Pryor the cause celeb, the cause du jour, and set a precedent with him, even though you said he didn't. I'd love to know those answers. I want to know what, what anybody else thinks, because to me, the issue of money can be easily solved if all you do is give these players, these students, they are called student athletes, not athlete students. If you give these student athletes a little bit of information and realize, hey, you can get money in legal ways and be able to have no issue in your future by just doing this. If you can tell them to do that and you can uh, get rid of all the boosters essentially and all these uh, extra privateers, you can get rid of them and you won't have any of these issues. And I think that's what America and the rest of the world will want even more than to see Congress get into it, is just to see it getting fixed and not have to hear about Terrell Pryor or Nevin Shapiro or the University of Oregon or, U or USC or anybody else who's had an issue. Because I, I think we're seeing more about the sports issues on SportsCenter anymore than we are about the actual sports themselves. Even the, the universities are taking taking action. I've seen at least two different universities now who have sent out pamphlets to their season ticket holders telling, pretty much outlining what the NCAA rules are and saying how can you not violate them. And that that's not what our universities should be spending money on doing, is having to send out these flyers to their boosters and to their athletes and parents and to their ticket holders. That's a travesty in my book, and that's why this needs to be fixed now. So somebody please start giving information to to us, but more importantly, try to send them to Roger Goodell, to the NCAA, because we got to get this fixed. It's no way that we're going to be able to survive another couple of years with all the incidents we're having. We're not going to have any teams that haven't been given the death penalty if this continues. You know, another thing too, uh, in the local uh, in the local arena around the Pittsburgh area, there was a group of uh, football players. I believe it was from Whitehall School District. I could be wrong, but it was on the KDKA news. These players basically had a sit-in because they were upset due to the uh, due to the state budget slashing uh, that uh, two of their football coaches could not be employed by the school district. 
and they were upset over the fact that they did not have a conditioning coach and they did not have, uh, I believe, a defensive coordinator. Uh, and they decided that they weren't going to practice anymore, that they were just going to hold a sit-in and basically have their voices heard. And I think I, I, I commend these students. I commend them because they are basically doing what the NFL Players Association did uh, with, with the collective bargaining agreement uh, that uh, they all wrestled over and all of a sudden they got to an agreement because the money ended up becoming the major issue here. But let's get to the brass tacks of this thing. If the student athletes got together and said, hey, no more. Let's get your act together, NCAA, or we're not going to play anymore. Just imagine how quickly the NCAA is going to basically get their act together and start uh, putting together some rules and regulations so we don't have the uh, uh, the University of Miami fiasco happening again, and we can prevent the trail prior debacle from happening. Uh, it's time that the people basically say enough is enough, and too much is too much. An NCAA lockout. I like it. Yes, I'm calling for it. You heard it right here on 3SN.